time. up dementia so we'll talk about frontal temporal dementia and then what i think personally even though they're all sort of frightening the most frightening of all which is the, the louis body dementia but that's just uh, but of course the big thing on tap this week if you haven't looked at all is the second interview project so find your older person um you can select another older person you don't need to keep interviewing the same person this one the process works the exact same way, talking to the person, transcript from the drop box, and then the discussion forum, at least the prompts to answer. So if you need an older person, I got some in my office, load them out for a week. Um, no, whatever you need. So if you have any questions about that, no one's asked any questions yet. I'm assuming everything is, is just fine. Um, the other thing I sent out an email last night too, not that you check all of Dr. Meyer's emails all the time. Um, but if you want some extra credit in the course, uh, there's an opportunity that just popped up uh, running a research project on humor. So I'll just leave it at that. So if you're interested, um, you want to earn some extra credit, just let me know and I'll give you the details. And if you are still interested, then you can do it. If not, no, no big deal at all. But I have a little space down there called the Humor Lab, and we're doing a little well, the Psych of Humor class, <clears throat> you'll be there tomorrow. Uh, we'll be talking about a research project that we're doing kind of as a class. And if you guys want to join in, you can grab some extra credit in the class. So just let me know. Send me an email. Just respond to the email that I sent out. I'll probably send out one more reminder. I'm trying to get people collected. Um, collected. It's a weird way to put it. Give me all the undergrads. Um, by around Friday. So no big deal. There's no rush if you want to, if you want to join in. So... But let's see where we left off. Um, and again, I, I'm assuming uh, you watched uh, the links that I sent. Um, man, I, this one always grabs me too. I mean, there, there is no good dementia, right? There's no good disease to get that's going to lead to dementia. But these last two are usually ones that people have never heard of frontotemporal dementia and then Lewy body. Um, let's talk about this a little bit. Amazingly, there's one part of frontotemporal dementia that most people have heard of. They just had no idea it was frontotemporal dementia. So what are we talking about here? Again, uh, all these different diseases, same process happening, just a different way of getting there. So just to recap, really quick, and bring your brains back to where we've been. With Alzheimer's disease, we have these amyloid plaques and tau tangles that start in the hippocampus. And the, the brain sort of deteriorates from the inside out. And that's what we're left with. So our, our first hallmark signs are things like short-term memory loss, et cetera, but it leads to complete loss of functioning. With Parkinson's disease, same process. We're going to have neural death, but a completely different way of going about it. We've got these little things called Lewy bodies starting in the lower brain stem and working its way up through the brain until it goes everywhere. And again, same process. First sign is... Probably weird things like constipation and loss of smell, and then our tremors. And then, of course, if it gets bad enough, it leads to death. It's we're on the dying. With frontotemporal dementia, same process, just two different proteins. One is a familiar friend, tau. Tau, but now we're talking about things that are starting in two places. Now we're starting in the frontal lobe, specifically the prefrontal cortex or the temporal lobe. And if the temp it's not ringing a bell. The temporal lobe is the lobe that's on the side of the brain, and that's where our speech centers are at. So frontal temporal dementia, the C3PO, that was just kind of a joke because it's the second protein there. Two different proteins involved in front frontal temporal dementia. Tau. Now we know what tau does, right? Remember tau? Tau is on the axons. It's like the railroad tracks. Again, just starting in a different place. Starting up here in the frontal, in the frontal lobes, and then one you've probably never heard of and I've never heard it before, I started teaching this class either, TDP43, that's a protein inside the brain. The interesting thing about this protein is we know it's in the brain, but we have no idea what it actually does in the brain. 
We don't know. We just know that it's supposed to be there. And we know that in front of temporal dementia, it's collecting in proteins. Again, same process. It's not being dissolved. It's not being processed correctly. And it starts to accumulate. So our hallmark features, if you didn't, if you didn't watch those videos, it's highly recommended. Um, I mean, one features a, a priest that lives right here in Northeast Ohio. Um, I, I tried to get an, a, like a recap, not a recap, but an update to see how she's doing. I, I have no idea, although I'm assuming it's not very well, because this disease, once it sets in, goes very rapidly. I mean, for those of you that did watch, I mean, to me, the one that gets me is the, the husband, um, who within what, a period of, what, two or three years, Goes from being just a normal guy. I don't know why I call myself a normal guy, uh, but literally to someone who is absolutely unrecognizable and completely unable to communicate with his wife and anybody else. Now he's living in facil a facility like long-term, round-the-clock care, and his entire life is unrecognizable. He doesn't even recognize his wife. Um, so three major types. Just skip through this, and then Louis Bond is the one we're really going to focus on today um, because you watched all the videos for this one already. Our first type. And this is kind of the idea here. Frontal temporal dementia is not one disease. It's actually a cluster of diseases that all happen in the frontal or the temporal lobes. The behavioral type. Now, this is the type that the guy had in the, in the CBS documentary. The behavioral type is the most common type of frontal, uh, of frontal temporal dementia. And really what I want you to know is what's happening. This is the prefrontal cortex. So the guy you saw... He has tau and TDP43 accumulating in his prefrontal cortex and it's dying. In fact, at this point, I would estimate that he has very little of his prefrontal cortex left, which is why you see such a stark personality change. So that's really the hallmark to this one. Prefrontal cortex, complete personality and behavioral change. The second type, EPA, is the speech-related frontal temporal dementia, at least where it starts. This one starts in the temporal lobe. Not the frontal lobe, it starts in the temporal lobe. But it starts to spread. People with PPA, the first hallmark signs are they typically have a difficult time understanding language or communicating at all through spoken language. I once saw, I, it's old, it was like, actually it was like a videotape, so old. But when I was at Ohio State, it's the first time I ever heard about this disease, and there was an interview with, with the woman, and people with this disease, they have moments of lucidity. So they're not, in the beginning, they're not chronically, like, in some type of state where they, they've lost it. But in the tape, it really set home. She, has, she had the PPA type, which is the same type the priest had in the, in the CBS documentary. But she said when she has moments where the dementia is setting in, she just said, imagine suddenly the entire world is speaking a language that you don't understand, and it's impossible to learn. That's what it's like to have EPA, because you, you lose the ability to understand any spoken language whatsoever. So it's as if, I mean, you're still speaking English, but I can't understand what you're saying. Because you just hear gibberish everywhere. What was the, my gosh, remember the, what was the frightening symptom that the priest noticed? Remember, what was her... The first thing when she knew something was wrong, even though she was having greater difficulty talking, because if you're a priest, you spend a lot of time talking to the congregation from the bird Bible. See the town? That's God. That's <laughs> Anybody? She looked in the mirror, and what happened? She didn't recognize her own face. Can you imagine? Like, she just said, like, I know I know this woman. Who am I looking at? And then, of course, she snapped back to lucidity. So PTA, the temporal lobe. And then finally, number three, the motor disturbance ones. There's actually three of these. These are in the frontal lobe, but in a very specific spot of the frontal lobe. It's about right here. If you just draw a line from your ear to ear, that's your motor cortex. And that's where the damage is getting done. The motor cortex is in the rear of the frontal lobe. And the one that you probably heard of is ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. What happens with this disease is the motor neurons are the first to go. They start to deteriorate. I remember about eight years ago, teaching this class for the first time, I, I was surprised to see that. I had, I had never 
connected the dots to think, oh, of course ALS is a form of dementia, because it's cognitive impairment. Portobasical syndrome. Portobasical syndrome is when people start to have almost like Parkinson's type symptoms, just extreme stiffness in their arms and their legs, almost to the point where they feel catatonic. And then PSP is a form of dementia where people lose complete ability of coordinated movement and balance. So it's a cluster of different diseases, all impacting the body in a different way. I will really highlight this with, with Lewy body dementia, but a key to these dementias and understanding what's actually happening is, you know, how do we know? How do we know the difference between this and maybe Alzheimer's or Lewy body or Parkinson's disease? How can we distinguish this from the others? Well, the first is the age of onset. This is typically, this is an unfortunate one, with frontotemporal dementia. This is a dementia that typically attacks younger people. So we're talking 40s. Young to mid 40s is when this typically sets in. So our age of onset is one key sign. It's happening early. The second is memory loss. We actually typically don't see memory loss with this type of dementia until later on. It's not starting in the hippocampus. It'll probably eventually get there. But memory loss is not something that we see. What we do see that we don't see in Alzheimer's until later is the behavioral change. So it's kind of flip-flop. With Alzheimer's, memory loss first, behavior, behavior changes later. With frontal temporal dementia, it's the opposite. This one also has the distinct speech problems that people have, whether it's speaking or actually understanding speech. Um, and hallucinations and delusions, which we'll really zoom in on with Lewy body, is relatively uncommon. So it's really mainly behavior, personality, and speech changes that we see. Which brings us to our last dimension before we turn the page to something else. We'll just get this ball rolling and then I'll just gonna let you watch something. We, uh, we were gonna watch the whole thing, but we ended up watching the whole thing on, on Monday, so we'll watch the whole thing today too. Um, what we're gonna watch is a it's a it's a brief documentary, um, about 15 minutes long or so, of a wife, not Robin Williams' wife, but um, her husband started developing just bizarre symptoms. They eventually discovered it was Lewy body dementia. And she filmed what happens inside their home so that people could see what it's actually like to live with someone who's suffering from Lewy body dementia. So that's coming up in a couple minutes. But first, uh, Lewy body dementia, again, same problem, just a completely different starting point. The starting point for Lewy body dementia is actually the cerebral cortex. So imagine, and that's the outer part of your brain, this one. Maybe this is why it's so frightening to me. This one starts from the outside everywhere and starts to work its way in. And we're also dealing with an old friend. Now we're back to our Lewy bodies, those alpha synuclein proteins. Parkinson's disease, it's in the substantia nigra, it's in the brain stem. Well, with Lewy body dementia, it's starting from the outside. These Lewy bodies are building up and they're, and they're slowly creeping their way in. In fact, when they looked at Robin Williams' brain, they were everywhere. There actually wasn't one part of his brain that wasn't impacted. Um, we're not going to watch, there's too much on him. But the doctors that did his autopsy said they don't even know how he was able to walk, much less function. This is looking at his brain, you would think this person would have been dead a year ago. Number three on our list. So if you're doing the math, Alzheimer's, about 70% of cases. Vascular dementia, 15%, so that's all the way up to 85. With this one, we're up to 95%. So now you can kind of fill in the blanks and see. So the number three cause, it's 
interesting. It's the number three cause of dementia, but it's probably the one that's the absolute least understood and least researched of the dementia diseases that we have. And it often gets, you might as well write this down now, because it's kind of the theme at the end. This one often gets misdiagnosed. This is the most misdiagnosed form of dementia. It gets misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's, and it gets misdiagnosed as Parkinson's disease, which it did happen in Robert Williams' case. I mean, it, it's not that that's necessarily wrong, because he was showing signs of Parkinson's disease. But that's not what it was. It was Louis body. We just didn't know it until he was dead. So until we're going to skip the symptoms. I'm going to I'll show you the symptoms, and then we'll make a list. But you can watch what this man is going through, um, and then you'll see the symptoms for yourself. And then we'll make our list, because I know we have to make this. My name is John Hamilton. My husband was John Hamilton. He was a native of San Antonio. When I noticed something was wrong was when he called me and he couldn't find his car. And I knew something was wrong. And for him not to be able to find his vehicle was very, very concerning. No, I can't see it. There's nothing there. No, I haven't lost my mind. No. Oh, let me turn the light on. Hang on. Lay down. Lay down. No, no. Lay down, please. Okay, stop. Let me let me look. Where is it? What is it? That's the headboard, honey. That's the headboard. It's not peeling off. Go back to sleep. You okay? What's gross? It's okay, honey. You okay? No. What can I do? Okay, I'm gonna go back to sleep. You'll go to sleep too? Okay, let's turn the lights off, okay? John Hamilton was the vice president of pharmaceutical companies. In the end, uh, when he started exhibiting symptoms, he was actually working with two doctors from uh, National Institute of Health, starting to launch a medication reminder device. He had gone to Stanford, Harvard, and Washington, D.C. It progressed uh, rapidly, and the cognition and being able to understand and, and drive absolutely was taken away from him almost immediately. He had a van. He loved this van. It was so ugly. But he took a ski rope and he tied his van so it was safe. Because I don't know how he tied that ski rope when he did. I mean, he, he couldn't even, his dexterity, nothing was there. What, what would you like to keep? I'd like to keep this too. This pair of shoes right here. 
Okay, and what about all this? What's this doing now in the closet? They're shoving what out? This has been going on all night. All night long. Yeah, I know. We come out here. Front door is wide open. Then he has another collection of thoughts. Whatever. With my front door. You know, the wall line. And you come down here and tell the garage. Which John, get in there. Please. What are you doing? Okay, well, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that right now. We're going to lay down. You've been up all night doing this. Okay, well, we're not going to do that. Put your shoes back over there for me. I'll put them in the car, okay? I'll put them in the car. I'm not going to do it right now. It's still dark now. Please. No, we haven't driven in two years. Can we stop? No. You can stop and be where you're stuck. Crunch the area. Do we even put those down a bit more? I don't know. I see. I did. Look, I did. You've been doing this all night. <coughs> December 31st, 2016. In the beginning, when I noticed that something was really wrong with John, I would take him to doctor after doctor, and they would say nothing was wrong. Um, I would try to explain to the physicians that this was muscle memory and training uh, tapes that he had said his whole life. But as far as the cognition, um, that was what they didn't really zone in on. And I told them that he was in bad shape and he needed help. But even to the very end with Social Security, um, with the physicians and with everyone, they said they did not see what I saw. It was myself and two children, two of them held shift. So my daughter, who had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one-year-old, was the primary with a demented father. And then at the end, she said, I can't do this anymore. And then I had a son do that from Massachusetts because I needed help. I was trying to work and pay the bills, and I had no money. I mean, he wasn't covered with insurance. He was in his 50s. We had done everything right. And we had absolutely no assistance. Everyone said, sorry, you don't qualify. Sorry, you're overqualified. Why do we have to wake up? Huh? I know. What we're saying for in our house. 
message to caregivers is to nurture, love, and understand that they don't know what they're doing, and it's much like an infant. And when an infant cries or an infant is upset, you, you nurture that infant. The people with this horrible disease, dementia, are just like infants, and we have to treat them with the same nurturing and love. You just told me that I am different from God. You are my gift from God. You're my kid from God. 
still trying to come out and communicate. I'm not sure if you noticed a little tear coming out of his eye in that last interview. And there's a moment where he, it's like he's got a lot more to say, but he's, there's still a part of him that's in there. He just has no way of getting it out. Um, and so that was that was made toward the end. So so over there, there, there there's our list. Of the, the, the really bizarre thing about this disease that people also don't understand um, you might not understand, and I don't. I don't understand either. Is you watch that video, you might scratch your head thinking, "Now wait a second. Three weeks later, he was dead. Like he seems, I mean, sort of okay physically, but but I guess the point is that's what's going on inside his head. The amount of the amount of plaques, the amount that's building up is it's remarkable. It's everywhere inside that man's brain, and his brainstem, and his limbic system, and his cerebral cortex, and it's not going to take too many replications of these plaques before everything goes. It's exponential. Where everything goes from, you're still kind of there. Maybe a week later, there's a 20% drop, then another 20% drop, and then the, the functioning is just completely gone. The strange thing, so what was I saying? The strange thing about this disease is how it fluctuates. These symptoms over there, the five big ones. How someone can be, in the beginning of the disease, you'll have little breaks. In other words, you might have a couple hours where things are really strange, but then you're back to normal and you're able to function. And that's why she made these tapes. We caught it in the beginning. She doctor after doctor, they kept saying, There's nothing wrong with this guy. Well, when he was there, there was there probably was nothing wrong with this guy. And she's trying to tell them, look, you don't understand. This is what's happening. I, she doesn't know what's going on. The doctors probably don't have a great understanding of Lewy body dementia because it's so misunderstood. So number one, of course, thinking. So the thinking can become just completely irrational at times. Sorry, I'm always doing this to you. Let's get in one of those mirrors and then this mirror. 
Then you'll have bouts of complete disorientation. What That was actually the first thing she remembered, is him calling her saying, I can't find, I'm not sure if you saw the whole thing, but he was just at a park. He was probably one of the only people there, and he's walking around saying, I can't find my car. He didn't know where he was. So you have these bouts of disorientation that come and go. If you notice how he's moving, the, the walking gets strange. People usually start developing a slow gait. This is something they notice in Robin Williams, by the way, the way he would kind of shuffle around. But I guess then you have a case like Robin Williams. Who the hell knows if that's Robin Williams just being funny or just trying to be strange or him being himself? And this is where it starts to get very bizarre. The hallucinations... Um, which the FS there stands for a false sensory experience. That's what a hallucination is. So seeing things, hearing things. But the main thing that people with this disorder experience are the visual hallucinations. And I put the word vivid there. I know not all of you took that normal sight. Some of you did. When you think of hallucinations, you probably usually think of schizophrenia, which is appropriate to think of. But the visual hallucinations that people have with schizophrenia are not what we call typically not vivid. In other words, they're kind of cartoony. They're, they're frightening. They can be shadowy. In other words, I might look at Dante here, and his head might start going a little bit like, like a banana or something like that. Like just something that's going to freak me out. But the hallucinations with this disorder will be hyper real. You might literally see a lion walk into the room and it looks like a lion and you have no idea if that's real. That's what he was explaining. Did you see the boards? To him, he saw something realistic that his wife wasn't seeing. Yeah. That's where it gets. We'll get the yeah. So that's, you know what that is? It, well, it's absolutely something to sleep in. Yeah, we'll get to that. So there, there could be a crossover there. It actually could be the cause of the hallucination. And we'll also see delusions, and that just means false belief, not Facebook, which is the FB stands for. And then last but not least, yes, a, a truly bizarre disorder that many people suffer from that has nothing to do with dementia at all. Something called REM disorder. And he's exactly right. It's, it's hard to know if when someone's experiencing a hallucination, maybe, maybe what we're actually seeing is some extreme form of REM disorder. Does anyone know what, what that is? True story. You don't need to write this down. This is just some from trivia for your next cocktail party. Um, about five years ago, a guy out in the UK um, just got married, and a couple of days into the marriage, he stabbed his new wife to death, stabbing her about 58 times in the bedroom before she died, and he was acquitted. They said, no, you didn't do anything wrong. And the reason he got acquitted is because he had a very well-documented history his entire life of REM disorder. What REM disorder is, is when you act out your dreams. Whatever you're dreaming, instead of just lying there, whatever is happening, you actually see it in the real world, and you act out. If you picture yourself climbing a mountain, you'll climb the furniture in your room. And in your brain, you're seeing Mount Everest, and you're actually climbing it. So, how many of you have been paralyzed? Every single night, this is kind of frightening that you didn't know. Every single night you go to bed, when you go, we kind of talked about the sleep cycles, remember? Well, this, I'm glad we did that because it's nice. Every time you go to sleep, about four or five times a night, something happens inside your brain and it's called REM atonia. That's why I wrote that up there. What REM atonia does is it paralyzes you, except for your eyes. That's why we call REM sleep REM, rapid eye movement. The only thing that moves is your eyes. Other than that, your body is completely paralyzed and on autopilot. You're not controlling your breathing. You're not controlling your movements. Have you ever heard of something called sleep paralysis? Sleep terrors? Some people experience these. That's when you you actually wake up while you're still in REM atonia. That's what makes it so frightening. You wake up and you're paralyzed. You can't move. You can't breathe. Because your body, or something's gone wrong between the REM cycle and the I'm going to wake up cycle. So when people wake up with REM atonia, it's horrifying. It's terrifying. And so people experience things like hallucinations and delusions because the brain is trying to make sense of what's going on. But REM disorder is something completely different. 
REM disorder is when our amatonia actually doesn't happen. There's supposed to be a neurochemical change inside the brain, and it paralyzes your body during REM sleep so that you don't act out your dreams. At least that's what they think. But that's what happens. So is, and she even said, it's like, I think you're sleeping. Because when you hear what he's saying, you can imagine a dream like that, like seeing weird things, like they're going to pave the road through our room, and I see this over there. It's almost like a REM weird dream that we have that makes no sense. And that's what the REM dreams are. REM dreams are the vivid dreams that seem hyper-realistic but often make no sense whatsoever. And you're like, how in the hell did my brain even figure that out? And there's usually intense emotion. Yeah. How is it different from sleepwalking? Well, like sleepwalking, you're not really – when you're sleepwalking, you're not in REM sleep. You're actually in one of the lower stages of sleep, like two or three or four. He was just talking and it looked like his, were his eyes open? His eyes were open. So he was still in the, like, round sleep Well, the only way to actually know would be to have some kind of brain thing on him while he's walking around. That's what distinguishes sleepwalking from REM disorders. REM disorders, it only lasts for like 10, 15 minutes while you're in the REM dream. But sleepwalking is not that, sleepwalking is when you're one of the lighter stages of sleep. So bizarre. Sleepwalking is another one of those big mysteries. That endlessly. All right. Sound like fun? No, this does not sound like any type of fun at all. So it gets misdiagnosed a lot. So what are some signs? How would we know whether this is Parkinson? The distinguish between Alzheimer's really is crystal clear. So the main misdiagnosis is between this and Parkinson's disease. But the reason we know this was Lewy body is if the dementia comes first. Remember with Parkinson's disease, the first thing that brings people in the room is typically the tremors. But we know now that Parkinson's disease is working its way up the brainstem. So tremors first. And then for some people, like Michael J. Fox, at least so far, there is no dementia. That's where it stops. So with Parkinson's disease, the dementia doesn't come until years after these first symptoms. It takes a long time. Parkinson's is a slow-moving progressive disorder. With Lewy body, though, the dementia is coming first, and then tremors. What Robin Williams was keeping secret from everyone was the hallucination and his non-ability to keep it together anymore. Back in his last days, there's a, there's a really good documentary called Robin's Wish. If you're interested in his story, it's really excellent. And it talks about his last days, but on his last movie he filmed, which was one of the Night of the Museum movies, he completely lost the inability to remember the third one. He couldn't remember any of his lines. They actually suggested he go do stand-up, but no one knew what was happening with him. But he would be in his in his studio room, or change whatever they call it, his room, crying every night with his hairdresser, with his wardrobe people. Because he, he knew and he was telling them, I've lost it. I don't know, I, I don't know what's happening. And with regards to hallucinations, when, when they did find him, but he had a collection of really old, old-fashioned wristwatches. And they found he was paranoid. He had notes about he was scared people were coming to steal his collection and he was sealing them up in things. So no one really knows if when he did take his life, did he mean to end his life, or was this the result of some kind of hallucination that he was having, a delusion where it happened? So, dementia comes first, Lewy body disease. Dementia and movement disorder at the same time, Lewy body disease. Dementia, one year after movement changes, Lewy body disease. With Parkinson's the dementia, the theme is that the dementia comes much, much later after the movement. Now, of course, the only definitive way to know is if we do an autopsy and look at the brain. And again, with Alzheimer's, the, it's really rare that you would get a misdiagnosis here because with Alzheimer's, we have the memory loss, which we generally don't see with Lewy body. In fact, the frightening thing about Lewy body disease, and I think I'm going to show you Robin, Robin's wife really quick, just a quick interview. And uh, she, she describes this pretty well. With Alzheimer's disease, there's almost this ignorance is bliss factor where people aren't aware that something's wrong. They, they lose that capacity. They don't know. You can tell that they have Alzheimer's disease, but they're like, what? I remember Glenn Campbell. It's like, I have what? What's Alzheimer's disease? What do you mean I have Alzheimer's disease? Okay, well, what the hell's that? But with Lewy body disease, the person is completely cognizant that this is happening to them. 
and there's nothing, they're trapped inside a brain that's no longer functioning. <laughs> Factors. Robin Williams died in August 2014. He left us with many laughs and memorable characters. Despite his larger than life spirit on screen, Robin Williams had several private struggles. His widow is showing sharing his story. Susan Snyder Williams wrote an editorial for the journal Neurology called The Terrorist Inside My Husband's Brain. It's about her husband's final year. She describes in loving and great detail his battle with Lewy body dementia. Schneider Williams says it drove her husband to suicide. And she wrote, it felt like he was drowning in his own symptoms, and I was drowning along with him. Lewy body is a condition that affects nearly one and a half million people. It's often very hard to diagnose because it has similar symptoms to Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. They include hallucinations, muscle stiffness, confusion, and loss of memory. Susan Schneider Williams joins us at the table for her first TV interview since writing about Robin's health struggles. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ryan. You can only imagine how hard this was for you, Susan, but you write in such eloquence about him that you were powerless in helping him see his own brilliance. Because so many people feel or felt at the time that he committed suicide because he was depressed. And you said, no, that's not it at all. No, there was so much more going on. Lewy body disease is comprised of over 40 symptoms, and it's very complex. And depression came in only near the end, you know, uh, probably within a few months before he left. And it was not a predominant symptom. And I think because he had a prior history over seven or eight years prior where he did have depression, but he hadn't had it for that long, that the tendency was to want to you know, pick up that as as the issue. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't focus only on that. So it, what did you see that made you think we have a problem here? We were celebrating our second wedding anniversary and it was October of 2013. And Robin started having gut discomfort. And through that experience, you know, it turned out to be nothing. The test results on that were negative. Uh, we thought it might be diverticulitis, but it wasn't. What did happen though is his response to that was alarming. You know, Ron and I had been together for six years to that point, and I knew my husband's normal baseline of fear and anxiety. And his fear and anxiety spiked and sustained at a level that was, was very scary. So that was kind of the beginning, really, the way I see it. And the next 10 months, we just we were chasing symptom after symptom. And the thing about Lewy body disease is the person is aware of their disintegration. They're aware of their abilities are declining. Whereas in Alzheimer's, they're not aware. It's That's a marked difference and can really kind of add to the terror of this particular disease. How much of it is physical pain? The sense that there's something going on inside of me that is just driving me. Yeah, that's a great question, Charlie. And I don't know if I have the answer to that, really. Because the brain, you know, the, all the different regions of the brain are affecting different things within us. I, I can't, I don't know. I can tell you that in his autopsy, the coroner's report was clear that he had Lewy bodies throughout all of his brain and brain stem. What? Nearly every region. What would he talk about? What would he talk about? Right. So what started to happen more and more was this issue around fear and anxiety and his concerns over... It got difficult for him to even um, interacting with people became very difficult. He would question things afterwards or during, and really in the realms of, you know, did I do okay? Things that focused around insecurity or fear. And he asked, did I have schizophrenia? Yes. So that was yeah. okay. When we found out, we thought we had the answer. A few months before he left, he was um, diagnosed with Parkinson's, mm -hmm. which is actually an accurate diagnosis. However, that was the clinical side. The pathology was that he had diffuse Lewy body disease, which is what took him. And when he, we were in that doctor appointment with the general neurologist asking, you know, what does this mean? And the Parkinson's, which I felt some sort of relief that we finally have an answer. Yeah. Yes, we have a name and we know, okay, so what does this mean? Well, Robin asked in that appointment, you know, do I have Alzheimer's, dementia, am I schizophrenic? And it was painful later to realize why he was probably asking those questions because he was likely keeping a lot of the, not necessarily the symptoms, but the degree of symptoms to himself. You also wrote in this piece, the caregiver is the ultimate key witness to the terrorism 
that they are experiencing their loved one go through. One in six people affected by, by brain disease. What's your advice to other caregivers? You were there. It's uh, just that they're not alone. Remember, they're not alone. And also to remember, and it's hard to hold on to this, but to remember that their loved one's symptoms are coming from the brain disease. It's not coming from their heart. Right? And um, it, is, it is terrifying to witness, yet the caregiver is the witness because the person is afflicted. They're, they're losing their ability and they may not be able to verbalize. You know, Robin was losing um, even verbal ability, finding words, weakness of voice. And so it's difficult for them to say in a doctor's appointment. Do you think that he was in danger of taking his own life, though, Susan? Not at all. Not at all. Nobody was. was. Yeah. We had a whole medical team. No one, no one saw that coming. I have to say this. I mean, well, you know. Yeah. And in 25 years, nobody made me laugh more than he did. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was remarkable. Yeah. When he was at a stage with you, uh, he, he took you somewhere else. Yeah. And it was remarkable. Yeah. yeah. And we have all that to remember. Yeah. Thank you. Thank There's you. a picture of you and, oh, and uh, I know. on your wedding day. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. You will help a lot of people. I hope so. A lot of people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Interesting little side note. When she wrote that piece uh, for neurology, which is a sort of a, a semi-academic journal, it was largely ignored. Um, and people didn't pay attention to it because, oh, you're, you're just the rich wife of, a, of an actor who who killed himself because he was depressed. And unfortunately, that was the theme that the media picked up on right away. You probably heard it too, that, oh, Robin Williams, he's just another depressed comedian, right? He's probably drunk on drugs, and, and he killed himself, right? And you've heard the story time and time again when that actually wasn't the case at all. So, and then we heard Parkinson's, which confused people, but then the picture became clear when we learned about Louis Buddy. Oh, any questions? All right, well, we're making a shift. Um, if you took that normal site and I'm looking around the room and I see some familiar faces, uh, Team A didn't have too many, but uh, this first part of mental health development will sound extremely familiar because it's sort of an introduction uh, to mental illnesses and, and the world of abnormal sight, but we are going to zoom in on uh, specific disorders that are highlighted in adulthood and, and in later life. So we've got a child psychopathology class here at Mount Union, which is mental illnesses and tiny people. Uh, we, we just have general abnormal psych, and in this class, of course, we'll focus in on mental illnesses that are dominant in older age. So mental health and adulthood, but let's, let's start here. This will be easy for some of you uh, from abnormal psych. Think back to your first psych class. Dante, I think I had you in psych 110, if I remember correctly. Maybe not. I don't know. Remember psych 110, introduction to psych. I'm not sure who you had it from. We all teach it a little bit differently. Um, I actually get to teach it in the fall. I can't be spent a long time, so I actually really like teaching intro to psych. Um, but the very first thing you should have learned uh, is the definition of psychology. It's actually like the first thing, the first sentence in the book that we've been using for like 10 years. What's, what's the definition of psych? What the hell? What is all this stuff? Remember, it's the study of two things. Yeah, human behavior. So we're studying human behavior and... Something else. That's, that's exactly what it said. Yeah, mental, mental processes. So why am I telling you this? So psychology, we study what goes on inside your head, and we study what you do. That's what, And we all do something a little bit different. I study humor. There's a research project going on that you can sign up for for extra credit. Um, so mental processes and human behavior. Um, so abnormal psych, right? Abnormal psych is the world of mental illnesses. So Abnormal sight must be the study of abnormal behavior and abnormal mental processes. That's exactly what it is. Um, some of you know this. Some of you might not. I'm not sure if I declared this or not, but I have a private practice. I'm also a therapist. So I spend some time diagnosing mental illnesses and treating them. Well, if you're going to have a job like that, you have to know what the difference is between just abnormal sight and a mental illness. The line has to be drawn somewhere, right? Because there's plenty of weird people out there. Lots of us do strange things. Lots of us do abnormal things. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have a mental illness. It could. It just depends. Think back to like fifth grade math. Remember when you learned about the normal curve? 
I guess the point is the world of normal covers a lot of ground. Like we give you a lot of wiggle room to be weird in what you do and how you think. But sometimes the thinking is so abnormal, the behavior is so abnormal that it actually fits the criteria for something that we can treat. And we call that thing a mental illness. So this is not a complete list. If you took abnormal psych, you'll remember, oh, this isn't as long as the list as I remember. But these are some of the questions that we ask. These are the main ones that we ask. If someone comes in my office and they don't know what's going on, some of the things you think of in the world of mental health, no, no, the first one's obvious. These are the questions we ask to determine, is it abnormal or is it a mental illness? The first one is clearly obvious. How much distress and suffering is the person actually experiencing from fill in the blank, whatever it is? Let's use substance abuse, because I always pick on like depression or something like that, but let's do something different. So let's just, well, alcohol, let's use that because it's easy. Let's use alcohol abuse. So is it actually causing the person a degree of suffering in their life? Have they been picked up for a DUI a few times or not? Maybe they're just fine. Social discomfort. Does what the person do, do, what, do, do what you do. I can't speak, but I'm a doctor. Social discomfort, in other words, is what the person is doing, does it make other people feel uncomfortable? Do you have a few drinks every night, or do you drink to the point where your family and friends don't really want to be around you? Because the way that you're acting because of behavior makes others feel uncomfortable. Irrational is your behavior, does it make sense? Are you drinking? Did you go to a wedding and you're having some drinks? Do you just drink and chill out every night? Is it the way that you unwind? Or do you put it in your coffee before you teach aging and adulthood? In other words, is the given what irrational means is given the context of your current situation, is what you're doing, does it make sense or not? It makes sense to have a drink or two at the end of the day. It doesn't necessarily make sense if you're bringing it to work or putting yourself in some position where you could actually get in trouble some, of some kind. Dangerousness. Now, what we're actually talking about is not necessarily a danger to others, but really a danger to yourself. Does this, this the behavior or the thinking cause the person to be a danger to themselves? You didn't know people with mental illnesses are ten times more likely to be the victim of some kind of abuse or, or danger or attack or assault that actually cause danger to someone else, although I know the headlines don't tell you that. Someone does something horrific, it's always, well, let's find the mental illness they suffered from. Oh, it was often. See, that's, that's why they killed them. But then last but not least, I have to have this one on the list. This is what we call the M word in the world of abnormal psych. Maladaptivity. We kind of talked about this with Alzheimer's disease. What is this? Something's maladaptive. What does that mean? Exactly. Maladaptivity is what finally brings someone in the office. Because whatever's going on for them is getting so bad, it's actually starting to cause major significant problems in their day to day function. Maybe they lost their job. Maybe they got in huge trouble. That's why they're in therapy. So, maladaptivity is just broadly means whatever's going on for you is finally starting to eat its way into your life. Unfortunately, this happens every semester. You always lose, lose a student or two. Um, I, I think some people's first reaction is, oh, lazy student, couldn't hack it, dropped out, probably partying too much. I guess as a therapist, my radar is a little bit different. My first assumption is, I wonder what's going on for that person. Like, I wonder if this, this could be depression, because depression can make someone fall off the radar for a long period of time. But anyway, more on that later. So this is a kind of a quick list, and we're not going to get, I'll just introduce this. This is the last cut and paste from abnormal site, abnormal people. I know you're out there. This is my favorite PowerPoint slide, actually, that I've ever made. I change the picture every once in a while, but the, the content is exactly the same. But no matter, I, I do some talks like around like schools and businesses and things like that. And as, if it's even remotely about mental illness, I always have this slide in there, no matter what it is. 
Um, because if you didn't know, the biggest problem we have, we have a lot of problems in the mental health care system, but the biggest problem that we actually have is ignorance. And I don't mean that in a like a derogatory way, so you're ignorant. What I mean is, by and large, the American public is completely uneducated about mental illness. They, they have no clue, and I, it's not their fault, because we never learn about it. In, in health class, in the public school system, no one ever talks about the freshman suicide until Johnny, the seventh grader, kills himself. Then all of a sudden they care about suicide and depression. And for a month, they'll have a mental health week or something like that. Does that make any sense? For a month, we'll have a week. No, it didn't make any sense. Right, but did, did you guys learn anything really significant? Usually there's a couple of like, yeah, my boys at what school? No, by and large, it's health classes and stuff. We never talk about mental illnesses. We put them in a special box as if they're somehow radically different from other illnesses. And we just keep it over there. And that's why it's so mysterious. But anyway... We're only going to get to like one of these, but that's perfectly fine. Just with this PowerPoint slide alone, which you'll hear the rest of in a brief online lecture that I'll do for you, um, is this will educate you more than about 90% of the American public. Those are the, these five points that I call the five truisms are stuff that people just don't know. Um, let's just jump to the last one. <laughs> just, just for fun, we have to pick one. Uncommon. Um, are they are mental illnesses common? It says hardly no. What's what's our current estimate of mental illnesses? In other words, how many people currently, right now, if I took a snapshot, meet the criteria for some type of mental illness that they could probably benefit from some type of treatment from? Any yeah, other About one in four, twenty-five percent. One in four. And it varies. And we'll just add something onto this too. I guess a side point, though, if we just took a snapshot of everyone, maybe this is a bad time to do this because we're in a pandemic, but how many, what percentage of people do you think are a, a little bit physically sick? The estimates are about the same, for probably about 25%, right? Well, why would your brain be any different than the rest of your body? But anyway, what's the most common? We'll just jump there. The most common overall, what's the most common yet? Not ADD. In fact, this one it's not even really close. I know I have normal psych people like, damn it. Yeah. How could I possibly forget? Yeah. It's anxiety disorder. So by far, in fact, it's estimated one in three Americans meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder. And the numbers are climbing all the time, which doesn't shock me. Because we're constantly creating more and more things to get anxious about. But for, and I'll just leave you with this, because this will be like a segue. For women, the most common diagnosis is some type of anxiety disorder. For men, the most common diagnosis, anxiety disorders are actually number two. Does anyone know what number one is for men? Substance abuse. Does that mean more men suffer from, or more women suffer from anxiety than men? Probably not. But it tells you a lot about how men deal with themselves and deal with their issues versus women, but more on that later. So this will be the kind of the segue. And so do your interview. If you have any questions, no one's asked any questions yet. And if you didn't hear, there's a research project going on. If you'd like to participate for some extra credit, let me know. Unless you'll hear all of us for I know my phone called twice last night. I was like, why did I just get two emails at this time? I was like, um, uh, Just remembered we're still live, so I'll end it now. <laughs> That's fine. No, nothing.